Jesus' parable is perhaps the best-known biblical illustration of what is commonly referred to as Murphy's Law, that if anything can go wrong, it probably will. In my life, I rely on the possibility of Murphy's Law and its pessimistic twin, expect the unexpected. Thinking about these things and planning for them allows for a plan of action to be created to respond to when things go wrong. Anticipating Murphy's Law has served me well when I've made vacation arrangements, planned road trips, or even worked on every home improvement project. Expect the unexpected, and if it can go wrong, it probably will. Perhaps this makes me a glass-half-full kind of person, but I believe if you expect things to go wrong and create a course of action, then you can invert Murphy's Law. For example, about this time last year, as I was making my plans for sabbatical, I anticipated that whatever could go wrong would, so I deliberately created extra time around the trip from the bus station in Detroit to the airport in Toronto. I knew, based on Greyhound's website, that the bus would take four hours to deliver me to the airport. So I added an hour for the border crossing, in case there was a delay. I added four more hours in case the bus broke down or there was a flat tire, because I wanted Greyhound to be able to come get me and get me to the airport on time. Well, I reasoned also that by allowing that extra time and building in that extra time, I could also arrive at the airport, get through airport security, check my luggage, and get lost at the airport. That was the only thing that really did happen. The rest of it went just as planned. But I had planned to invert Murphy's Law. And as I said, thankfully nothing went wrong, so I ended up having nine extra hours to hang out at the airport. Surprisingly, though, that time passed quickly. And I also experienced an unexpected surprise early in the trip. I thought when I purchased my seat through Travelocity, I'd purchased my tickets for the back of the plane to be beside the bathroom just in case air travel and I didn't get along real well. So when I sat in my seat and I'm looking at this ticket, to my confusion, it said A01. And I'm going, where is A01? That doesn't even sound right. So I went up to the person at the desk and I, and I showed my ticket. Am I even on this plane? And she looks at it, looked at me, and she goes, oh, yes, sir. In fact, you should be on board now. Wait, what? I thought I had another half hour. Oh, no, you should be on this plane right now. So I boarded the plane. No one is on the plane except the flight crew and me. And we had a great conversation and a gorgeous breakfast together while I sat in first class. It was wonderful. So see, when you invert Murphy's Law, good things happen. So plan ahead. And this was just the first of many additional similar experiences I had on this trip. And I realized, most of the time, Murphy's Law, when it reared its ugly head, could have made life miserable. But since I planned ahead and with God's help, I was able to have a good outcome. And I even got to a point during the summer where I considered altering Murphy's Law from what can go wrong will to If anything can go wrong, it probably will. But if you plan ahead, then with God, we can witness God's presence. Now, granted, that is not going to fit on a bumper sticker and people will fly by faster than they can read that. But for me, it seems to work because it appears when you look at the gospel reading that some of the women also have the conclusion that I had that if you prepare in advance and you trust God, you can invert Murphy's Law. And the Gospel of Matthew The wise women went to the wedding prepared with extra vials of oil, and then they waited for the bridal party to arrive. Sure enough, as they planned, Murphy's Law reared its ugly head, but they had prepared ahead of time, and they were able to follow the bridal party into the reception. According to one commentator, this parable was included in the Gospel of Matthew as a response to the worries many, many people in the early church had expressed. It's estimated that Matthew's gospel was written 20 to 50 years after Jesus' death. So taking those two large numbers, if Matthew was written in the 50s, 
Then the early church witnessed the destruction of the temple by the Roman Empire. If it was written earlier in the 20s, then it was written during a time when the early church was being arrested and persecuted by the Roman Empire. The point being, this gospel was written in the midst of violence, and many in the early church suffered. And they raised theological concerns regarding the delayed second coming of Jesus. Some believed that like the groom in the parable, Jesus also had been delayed. And this created great fear among the believers, especially as they watched loved ones die from old age and illnesses. And they witnessed loved ones tortured and killed, often in brutal ways, by the governing Roman Empire. Many in the early church grew restless and they grew impatient because they believed that once they gave their lives to Jesus, then he would fulfill his promise to return for them soon. Or at the very least, surround them in a protective bubble so that evil could not touch them. Instead, they point out, things have continued as they always have, even from the beginning of creation. The members of the early church questioned the apostles and the church leaders asking, where was Jesus and when was he coming back to rescue us? Why do things keep going wrong? And if God truly loves us, then why does Murphy's Law persist to interfere with our lives? And they wondered, how can evil arrive in places that should be holy and off limits? Once again, questions that were asked then are being asked today, specifically as they relate to the events that took place last Sunday when a terrorist entered a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and killed 26 people. And not only are similar questions being asked this morning, there are some new ones as well. Questions like, should there be an armed guard positioned at the church doors? Should metal detectors be stationed outside the sanctuary? Should there be a police cruiser in front of every house of worship today? There is a fear that evil will strike again. Yet the New Testament authors knew the face of evil. And when they were asked by the congregation how to respond to violence, they responded with encouragement. In the letter to the Thessalonians, which was also written about the same time as the Gospel of Matthew, Paul informed the church that bad things will happen, but in the midst of violence, death is not the end point. He assured the church that we do not grieve as others grieve, because we have hope. And he added, encourage one another with these words. In his letter, Paul addressed the Thessalonians' shortage of hope and grief. For Paul, he understood their grief because he also experienced similar grief. He knew loved ones who were arrested by the Roman Empire. And he had friends persecuted for following Christ. And he admitted that at one time he was responsible for the persecution of the early church. But in Christ, he professed, our faith, delivers hope. Because in Jesus there is strength, and in Christ there is a victory over death and the grave. Though to be sure, Paul didn't tell them to stop grieving. He simply said, grieve as persons with hope. In other words, as people with hope, we do not respond to evil with evil actions. Rather, we keep loving and we keep displaying that Christ is in our lives. One way to do that is to prepare for when bad things happen. Returning to the parable of Matthew. The women had no idea they were going to enter a time of darkness. But those who came prepared were able to emerge from the darkness and enter the festivities with the bridal party. A component of hope is planning how we will respond to things going badly. For example... We make plans to escape a building that's on fire. We make plans to retreat to the basement in case a tornado threatens our lives. Likewise, since we live in a broken world that believes the easiest solution to problems is to kill it, 
then we have to plan ahead to be sure. I'm not excusing the actions of a terrorist. And I also do not intend that we can relieve ourselves from the hard work that needs done to end the cycle of violence or to find productive results to help those with a mental illness or to help those who have anger management problems or even what to do with guns. Those discussions need to come. But right now, this morning, I'm addressing the reality of what you and I can do right here, right now. And that is to hold on to our trust in God with hope. Holding on to hope and God's promises, I'm reminded of the Underground Railroad and the hope held by those who escaped the darkness. One of the major ways escapees were assisted was the use of candles and lanterns. On the Ohio side of the Ohio River, there was a homeowner, John Rankin, who would place a lantern at a window when the authorities were absent as a way of communicating it's safe to cross the river. The escapees simply had to follow the light to escape the darkness. Today, our country is under a cloud of darkness. But we are encouraged to stay awake and make plans to preempt Murphy's Law. And by doing this, we have the ability to hold firm to the love of God as we live into the hope of God and offer this hope so that people can escape the darkness of evil. We can hold on to hope that God can invert Murphy's Law. And though holding firm to hope may not make sense, Proverbs 3 which, by the way, was used by the pastor of the Sutherland Springs Baptist Church, Pastor Frank Pomeroy, one week before an act of terrorism. Proverbs 3 informs us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to the Lord and your paths will be made straight. Pastor Frank relied on this proverb and said we need to rely on God when we come face to face with evil. We are reminded that the church has been challenged before. And every time evil thinks it has overcome the light of Christ that shines from us, Christ's church has prevailed. At the conclusion of Pastor Frank's message, he invited the congregation to commit their lives to Christ and to ask themselves, just as we must ask ourselves, Do we trust Jesus when we come face to face with evil? And a similar question. Do we believe in hope and faith that God can invert Murphy's Law while we offer a light of hope to those in darkness with arms wide open to embrace strangers rather than cutting ourselves off, surrounded by human security?